Hi, this is Paul, and The Distributist has a channel on YouTube, and I've spoken with him once, and I, after watching, he tagged me in this video on, on Twitter, and after I watched it, I told him I was going to call him the disruptive, the disruptivist, because it's this, he, he does some stuff in his videos that really gets in my head and uh, has me thinking in new ways. And so he's a, you know, I, I really appreciate his insight, whether I agree or disagree with him. He really gets me thinking in some different ways. And he did this video on, on Mencius Moldbug, who I, I didn't really know anything about, but it's someone that, that many who watch my channel will probably know something about. I was um, early, pretty early on. People told me that this was a channel I should watch. And the main que question was, why does the left always win? And, you know, the right side of history and all this. And his video is about an hour and 15 minutes long. So for those of you who watch my videos, it's not a very long um, it's not a very long video, but why does the left always win? And I thought, well, his, and then he, he kept talking about it. And he talked about basically um, conservative drift towards the left, how um, Taft is more conservative than Ben Shapiro, and on and on and on. He goes th um, over that through history. And now notice 1518. Uh, I could have used 1517. We'll get there in a minute. But and, and the more I thought about this, I thought, boy, he's got a point. And <laughs> it's always, it's, you know, Peterson talks about the fact that when, when you have to change an idea, it's, it's painful because a little, a little something in your head dies and, and you never like that death. And so, you know, we, we always want, we always want everyone and everything to validate us and affirm us and agree with us. And so when when you find something that makes a good point and you have to admit it, it's like, oh, crap, that's a good point. And yeah, there's issues with it, but it's a good point. And and then you have the question of, well, well, what is left and right? And I just finished watching a John Anderson video that, that also caught my attention. I hope there's a chance I might talk with John Anderson. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's something coming up. I've got some plans in the works for things, and that should be on video. But but defining the left, and, and the guy who John Anderson was talking to made the point that this left and right came from the French court, where the progressives sat on the left and the conservatives sat on the right for the, for the king, and this has carried on through history. And I always kind of wondered where this left and right comes from. But but of course, this this whole premise, why does the left always win? And like certainly during my lifetime, I've seen a lot of that, even though politically we tend to swing back and forth. This this kind of social progressivism keeps marching steadily onward and seems to get win after win after win. Now, I've got some yeah buts about that, um, for example, uh, prohibition. But well, maybe that's even an example of the left. Well, we'll get there. So, so I've got a lot I could say about that, but I don't want that distracting me because there's a real point in here that he really made, and 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 so yeah, he's the dis, he's this he's the disruptivist, and he disrupts my head, and he bothers me, and I I I kind of like being bothered in that way, and I don't. And and so what exactly is the left? And so it's hard to define, and we know it when we see it, and and he talks quite a bit about that, and it's a good video. You should watch the whole thing. And, and he talks about, you know, this was a part of the reason when people kind of disrupt you is because they, they make points that you already agree on and then they make new points. And they're, and you know, one of the things I've always said is that the Republicans and the Democrats, they're, you know, they're not that far apart on many ways. Now, there are obviously some defining issues that they use as wedge issues against each other. And again, I don't generally like talking a lot of politics in my video, but my videos, but I'll hazard it for this one. And he talked about the, the social structure of George Orwell's 1984. You have the inner party and the outer party. And and he made the point that the, you know, the 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 Democrats and Republicans, they, they you know, the, the White House and the, the power swings back and forth, but the entire swinging is kind of continuing to march left. And so the Republicans are kind of loyal opposition, and the distributist point is that you know, you can't really look to them to, you know, to, to carry the day for you. And, and other conservatives that I listen to, like Rod Dreher, has, has made similar points. And, and many, many times over the years I've voted third party because I can't stand either party. And uh and sometimes yeah they're 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 the same in many ways 
And then he makes the point that left drift is cultural entropy. And, oh, there's another colonized my head. You know, the mug doesn't get put back together. And, and, and so, okay. And yeah, all right. Mm. And, and, you know, we're seeing this in a sense in terms of arcs of civilization. And that's a favorite way of looking. What is, when does the American civilization hit its decline? When does the British civilization hit its decline? When does the Roman Empire hit its decline? And, you know, those are big, big arcs that, that go over many, many centuries sometimes. And, and how can we judge and can we judge from in the middle and what does that mean especially when we all have our own little arcs which is which are our lives and and then he said well you know maybe one way to frame it is i don't know that he said maybe but was, was righteousness and lawlessness now i've been i haven't posted the last couple of weeks i have to get busy with that but in my adult sunday school class i'm going through first john and first john is a very black and white book and 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 so we're dealing with that in the in the Sunday school class. But this righteousness and lawlessness is a, is a thing is a theme in the New Testament. And there's the man of lawlessness that arises in the book of First Corinthians. And and Jesus' theme in the Sermon on the Mount is righteousness. And before I've made the point that Dallas Willard and the Divine Conspiracy really helped me connect up Jesus' talks on righteousness with Plato and his Republic and righteousness and this theme of the ancient world of righteousness and what it is versus lawlessness. And this is external in terms of the rule of law and law in a society, but it's primarily internal. And I just finished my my sermon, Jesus Has a Punchable Face, that I that's going up today. Today is Friday... Friday the 8th, Friday, February 8th, and, and so that rough draft for Sunday video is going up today, and, and, and I talk about the fact that, you know, you have to have an internal, you have to have, to have an internal law inside of you, and, and, this, and this internal law helps you say no to certain kinds of temptations that will be damaging to you, and, and, and these things scale all the way out to society. I lived you know, I watch people complain about corruption in the United States, and certainly there's corruption here, but it's not like it was in a place like, for example, the Dominican Republic or many, many other countries of the world. Uh, this and, and this corruption is, you know, it, it has to be found in individuals, and that's why, in a sense, the, the argument that a democracy cannot live with, with you know, if you don't have if you don't have a population with its own internal sense of morality and right and wrong and and resistance against corruption and and all of those issues. And so, you know, gosh, he made a good point with this one, too, in terms of righteousness versus lawlessness. And I had to say, yeah, no, again, I can go into a bunch of yeah, buts and there's there's ways that we can talk about that. But it's a it's a good point and it's an important point. And so yes to that one too i mean he's carrying me along through his arguments and i'm he's he's begrudgingly dragging me into them it's it's the relaxation of the inner law and this was a key thing in that video too that i'd never that i that i'd seen some articles this week and i'd kind of been thinking about it but when he said it in this video i saw it and the relaxation of inner law is afforded by technology and so you you actually have kind of a an internal heart corruption entropy which is which is which is supported and fueled and encouraged by the ongoing march of technology that that things that in the past let's say a, a young woman would have to be very careful about her selection of sexual partners because of the risk of pregnancy but now with reliable affordable sometimes free contraception you know, she, there's no, there's very little risk of getting pregnant. And so, well, then she can have sexual license. But the further we go down that road, the more we realize, oh, but the, the, the risk of pregnancy was only one risk. And in fact, there's a, there's a vast, rich, deep, metaphysical, metaphorical reality that these old laws inhabited and now as technology affords us to affords us you know why why watch my weight and what i eat when i can control blood pressure and cholesterol with drugs why why go to the gym if i could if i could get my if i could get my 
my physical fitness in a drug, why should I go to the hard work of getting a gym? If I can get my spiritual experience by taking a psychedelic, why go to the hard work of years of spiritual and religious discipline? Uh, you know, there's, there's this way in which technology continues to, to enable us and afford us the the easy wins and so you can kind of see the corrupt the corrupting nature of technological progress and if you start to if you start to pull all of these things together in a society his his point about leftward drift oh man I hate it when someone else is right and I got to rethink myself and little little cherished ideas and norms in my head have to die. Oh, in Christianity it kind of sets you up for this because there's a thing called mortification where 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 parts of us have to die so that Christ can become alive and so oh and then the question, of course, which this this one's easy because this one fear grabs hold of us and motivates us. Will the center hold? Is it is it all one big long slide down the slippery slope to to chaos and or tyranny and or destruction and the death of our civilization, which all of us know that well, at least Christians believe that civilizations all tumble, and um, there's only one. There's only one kingdom that will finally last, and that is the kingdom of the Son of Man. But, of course, I'm an American, too, and I don't want to see the chaos and the, and the breaking down of, of the achieved order that I enjoy in here early 21st century affluent America. I, I love the freedoms I possess. I love the comforts I receive. I love all of this stuff. But then, of course, there's the opposition that says, well, it's a brave new world, and, and maybe Ray Kurzweil is, is right, and we'll offload our... I don't really think we will, because, again, the more we discuss... If you also watch Verveke and the and the cognitive science stuff, the, the idea that we'll just simply offload ourselves into a computer, well, the problem wasn't so much our limitation in computing power, the problem was our ignorance of ourselves, which is what we keep bumping into. But, of course, the... The eschatological promise of the religion of technology is that we will always find a fix for what ails us. But that then pushes the question again. It's back onto us. What is a human being? What exactly is flourishing? And, and then he said, and then uh, the distributist or the disruptivist said, a trigger word for me, which is salvation. And if you're in my Sunday school class and you start using that word lightly, I will jump on you because what, and I, I don't want, well, that doesn't mean I'll be mean to you. I'll just say, I'll define that word for me because saved from what, or even more importantly and more difficult, saved for what? And, and who is we? And, you know, he makes the point that, well, we'll be saved by technology. Well, the we and that are our, you know, are they those are cyborg ancestors who are half machine, half human beings? Because you can't have these conversations without asking the 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 question of telos, um, renovation from the inside out. But towards what point? To what point? You need these you need these guiding stars in order to be able to orient us. Now, one one young man who man who grew up in a different country and is in the United States doing graduate studies, a very, a fairly oppressive country. I'm not going to name it because I don't want to risk any, you know, I don't want to risk anything. But but ask the question at our meetup, what is a utopia? How would we define utopia? And, and, and you know, it, the point that he was making is that there's, all of our little moral decisions are orienting, are orienting us and pointing us towards some type of utopia or some type of endgame that, that we imagine. We imagine in our head. We think we know what the good is that we're pointing to. We think we know what salvation is. And, and so if you're a conservative and you look at this leftward drift, you say, oh, it's corruption. While many people are cheering and saying, oh, it's improvement. So you've got Steven Pinker on one side and you've got, you know, the, the, dis, the disruptivist on the other side. And, you know, here we go back and forth. And, and a lot of the question is, well, what is good? Saved for what? Saved from what? 
Who is we? What is utopia? What is truly good? Is it in, in our meetup, you know, we talked about flow states and you know, we, always, we often do some discussing of my videos, but usually discussing of what other topics come in. But, you know, if we could put a, a, a helmet on with uh, magnets in to get our brain into flow state so that we can properly function or if we can, you know, if we can if we can somehow shed our bodies and be free, you know, in some sense, I'm continuing to read through Michael Pollan's book. Well, I'm enjoying that book. It's a good book. Um, you see that people ask me for favorite books and it's such a hard question for me because I often love the book I'm most stuck on right now. I, I fall in love with books and and then, oh, that was a wonderful book. And then I'm on to the next book. And so what's my favorite book? It's probably the last book I really loved. So... You know, enjoying Michael Pollan's book. What a gifted author, and really appreciating his voice and and his ability to write. And so, so, so anyway, see, I distract myself. But how do we know the good? Get you know, maybe just take some drug and take soma. You've got Brave New World, and so the individual raised the utopian question. He had just finished reading Brave New World, and I thought, yeah, that book will get into your head. But what stars do we navigate? And, and to me, this gets back to the Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson conversation, because Sam said, well, well-being. Well, we have we have a sense of well-being. And, and from what I could perceive from Sam Harris, he thought that that sense of well-being just kind of scales. And, and what I get a sense of is that this is A-B testing, that this thing is better than that thing, and a comfortable shoe is better than a shoe that pinches, and a, and a meal that tastes good is better than a meal that doesn't taste good, and a relationship that feels good feels is better than a relationship that doesn't get, feel good. And Jordan Peterson via Piaget pushes back with a with a devastating argument about the equilibrated state that in fact this it it, it this goodness not only has to scale for me and my neighbor and all the way out to everyone in humanity, but also has to scale for, for me and future me and, and my descendants, but also my ancestors. And so, you know, Piaget I I you know, I, I, like many of you, had introduction to a little bit of developmental psychology in college and Piaget, and but I, I, what, what I'd love to see P, I'd, I'd love to see Peterson recommend a, a book about Piaget and his quest to, to resolve the, the science religion debate, because that was the first time I'd ever heard that, and I heard it from Peterson, and he talks about this equilibrated state, and you, you very much get the sense of, well, this is really a handle on, on something like the kingdom of God, or something like goodness, and and Peterson again and again points that, you know, you need reference points, and, and my point is that you really need reference points outside of the iron box of secularism, and, and that's why religion is so fundamentally important, because you can actually look back in time through history, and 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 why concepts of revelation are important because they get metaphysical and you need you need something that big to an or to enable to orient it because this kind of a b testing uh jonathan merritt had a tweet about you know well he was kind of riffing on uh cone marie my <laughs> you know, cone marie hits netflix my wife had done a cone marie thing in the house about about a year ago and it made me grumpy because oh she's throwing away all the stuff she wants to throw away some of my stuff and and she wants to change the house and so i was getting grumpy because usually if it's a good thing that i know it's a good thing and i don't want to go along i get grumpy because you know i i love my i love my comforts and my and my and my pet sins and my and, and my self-indulgences but you know she organized her closet and her closet looked great and before you know it i thought I'm going to do that to my closet because I want my closet to look like hers. So I went through my wardrobe and whatever. And boy, that spark joy thing just really annoyed me. It's like, oh, spark joy. Arr. The curmudgeon doesn't like that. But okay, I went through my went through my wardrobe and whatever didn't spark joy, I got rid of. And I got rid of all kinds of crappy stuff that was, yeah, too old. And I'm not a fancy dresser. Y'all can see that. Um, but, you know, but in the end, it was a good thing. And, you know, doggone it. I was, and that's the way it often is. My poor wife, you know, she'll start down some road and I'll drag my feet and grumble and she'll get annoyed with me and then we'll have a little spat and, you know, and I'll back off and, and then, you know, sometimes she'll be proven right and, and then I'll have to say those most awful words in marriage. You were right. I was wrong. <laughs> 
there's some words that you can't live without in a marriage. But, you know, so, but, but this, you know, this, this A-B testing in the short run, Jonathan Merritt makes the point that you should, you know, give up any, throw out any theological system that doesn't spark joy. That's quite frankly a bad idea because most of the most of the truths, the really important truths in my life, are truths that don't. It doesn't give me the sense of sparking joy. They're they're things that I begrudgingly have to admit to or relinquish to. Um, you know, C.S. Lewis calls himself the world's, you know, England's most. How did he say it? Reluctant convert, and and, and so often, you know, this is part of the reason I'm a I'm a I. I associate with this label Calvinism, I identify with it, is, is because so often Jesus has to pull me kicking and screaming and I don't want to go and dang it, Jesus is so strong and yeah, but so it is. And, and so, yeah, if I could do all my morality testing, A-B testing, well, Actually, that's a really bad way to judge morality, and the the real challenge is to is to work this equilibrated state idea to see what what ideas are better and right for the long term. Someone in the someone in the um, someone in the meetup had seen some article somewhere that said that the German people were their happiest during the 30s and 40s, which of course. Um, came at the expense of the Jews and the Slavs and and everybody else in Europe, and then became their more miserable. And then I, I, I haven't posted this conversation, but I had a conversation with a young man from Germany, and he was telling me how, you know, Germany's in kind of a mess because their identity in the 20th century, you know, they're the pariahs of the world, which means that they can be guilted into almost anything. And 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 you see that dynamic in individuals, and what happens when a when a whole nation takes that on, and you know, on one hand, it might look like Christianity because it looks like generosity, but generosity motivated by by the wrong things does not yield good fruit. And so, you know, all this stuff is enormously complex. So our little A B testing about goodness and sparking joy and 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 morality that really doesn't that really can't get you there. So, so the distributist is a is a conservative Roman Catholic, and so he says, "Well, what's the start of this? The Protestant Reformation." Ah, <laughs> and and I I get his point. I get his point. You know, the rebels break the law and the church and the institute for their new cathedral, as as he says in the video. And and there's a good point, but now. Now, you know, you, that, I, I'll kvetch at a bunch of things and I'll hold it to myself. But when we get to this point, I'll, I'll, I, I can't hold back because the, 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 the righteousness versus lawlessness, that's a very nuanced, subtle, complicated dynamic. And, and you could make the point of Paul who lays aside, in fact, that's exactly the point the Judaizers make with Paul. You're setting aside circumcision. You're setting aside dietary laws. And, and, for, the, and for the Gentiles, perhaps as, where did I make that point? Um, I guess I made it probably in the sermon that I just, that I just did the rough draft for. That, that, you know, one just as just as Jordan Peterson observes via Nietzsche that the the discipline of Catholicism in the West, you know, honed the the European spirit and strengthened it. You you can make a similar argument that the the discipline of resisting uh, polytheism in the Old Testament, resisting the Baals, resisting Molech, resisting the gods of Babylon, resisting the gods of Egypt, that, that this in the Jewish people over centuries made them strong and durable so that they wouldn't assimilate. You know, in, in some ways, the, the world's most stubborn culture, they wouldn't assimilate. And, and, and what that has for the most brought them over centuries is, is pain and, and hatred. And, but, you know, there's a, but they held together that way, and they they remained themselves that way, and and so you might argue that Jesus, 
you know, this is exactly the point of Jesus' culture war. Jesus, you're soft on, on Roman sex trade of young Jewish girls. Jesus, you're soft on, on fasting. Why aren't your disciples fasting? Well, when the bridegroom is there, they don't, you know, the, 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 the party doesn't fast. And Jesus, all of those things could be excuses for holding the line against the corruption that the Romans are bringing to our society. So, yeah, I'll, I see the point on the Protestant Reformation, but one could make similar points on Jesus and Paul. And, and there's a sense in which the fight against lawlessness becomes legalism. And as I think it was Tertullian said, you know, on, on one half, on one side, you fall off the horse on the antinomian side, on the other side, the legalist side. So th there are issues with this whole argument, but there's real value in this argument. And there's insight to be gained by thinking through this argument and wrestling with this argument. For most, for most good arguments, they are, they are things that you really have to live with. And they're then they're like you know not really a little angel or a devil on your shoulder, but they're they're like a little personality in the back of your head, and you'll run along in life, and you see something, and that person says, "Yep, yep, 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 that's that's my point." And and so the the consciousness committee tries to keep you you know keep you keep you honest via those kinds of things. Bonhoeffer, you know, again books, uh, Bonhoeffer's cost of discipleship, and if if. If you've never read Bonhoeffer's Cost of, if you've never any Bonhoeffer, read Bonhoeffer. So many good authors, but Bonhoeffer, of course, was 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 part of the German elite that didn't go along with Hitler, and um, was was part of a a conspiracy to um, to assassinate Hitler, and and paid for his participation in that in a. Um, in a German prison and was eventually executed before the end of the war. But, you know, he was one of these outliers who, who wouldn't go along and, you know, lived an interesting life and someone who could have escaped Germany. You know, he, he was, he had access, he had money, he had status. He could have escaped Germany, but he stayed and he, and he stayed at the cost of his life. And he writes in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, which, which warns against cheap grace. And, and so here in Christianity, you're always dealing with how to deal with the law. And so people ask about what's the difference between Lutheranism and Calvinism? Well, Calvin, Calvin brought up both, both Luther and Calvin would be horrified that we have those two labels today, by the way. So maybe I should stop using Calvinism as a label. But, you know, Calvin said we have the, you know, Luther had this stark antithesis between law and grace. And, and given Luther's story, you can have that. Calvin is a second generation reformer. He, he says, well, he comes up with a third use of the law. The law is to, you know, the, the use of the law by civil magistrates to keep order. That's, that's fair. Um, but the third use of the law is to, is, is now we can express gratitude. And so those of you, if you watch my rough dress for Sunday, see misery, deliverance, gratitude, misery, deliverance, gratitude. We use the law to express our gratitude to God because in a sense the law does in fact reflect God's desires, but now we don't use the law as, um, as a way of saving ourselves. So if you look at the Heidelberg Catechism, the treatment of the Ten Commandments comes in the gratitude portion. This is, this is how we as Christians live the Christian life. And this is how Calvin tries to, you know, kind of pull back from Luther. But one of the big, one of the big questions, one of the big issues throughout Christianity in the West, now I know the Orthodox have, have, uh, the Orthodox come in and say, yeah, if you'd listen to us, you wouldn't have these problems with, with grace and law and some of those things. Um, and maybe I'll have those conversations when I talk to my friend Luke Thompson from Twitter one of these days. But th th we're always dealing with this question of, of, of faithfulness and lawlessness or righteousness and lawlessness. And, you know, I'm a big fan of Tim Keller and Tim Keller better than most persuasively argues that for for Tim Keller you can find the Veritas forum you google or you search it on YouTube you'll find it Tim Keller homosexuality and, and watch the whole conversation that Tim does in a Veritas forum or a Veritas forum um debate where well, he'll you know where they 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 really try to corner poor Tim on some of this stuff and and Tim will basically make the point it's self-righteousness that gets you damned. 
well, what do you mean by that? And and actually, that's that's very existentialist. Tim Keller is a big fan of Kierkegaard. Um, I know Esther doesn't seem to like Tim Keller near as much as I do, nor Kierkegaard, but Julian will like that. Um, those of you who don't pay much attention to the comments, these are all these are all folks that I've met since I've started this this crazy wonderful journey into YouTube land. But you know, so, so you have this question of well, how does this all work? And this continues to be a live debate and and part of converse big part of the conversation in Western Christianity. What is the relationship between righteousness and lawlessness? And where are the inflection points? And and that's why you know, this, this is all is hard. So then you have the, the cycles of civilization. Rome descends into chaos, and the church in monasticism grows a new Humpty Dumpty over a thousand years. But you might argue that, you know, from 500 to 1500, roughly the, the Middle Ages, is, you know, there you, is that a heyday of Christianity? And does, does then Protestant Reformation um, provoke the, the next descent, which we're 500 years into. So is the cycles kind of Western civilization, or is it certain nations, the rise and fall of France, the rise and fall of Britain, the rise and fall of the Dutch Empire, the rise and fall of the American Empire? Now, our poets prophesy zombies and a dystopian future where, once again, inner strength offers communal competitive advantage. Um, you know, if you watch the if you watch The Walking Dead or or any other dystopian futuristic things, you know, so often the the inner conflicts must I must I put my life at risk to avoid killing or shall I kill instantly? I mean, these things hover around various dystopian future apocalyptic movies because that that's really where it engages. And again, it's the question of inner strength or inner righteousness and and the risk. And part of why part of a point that I make often in terms of my messages are that this is exactly where the resurrection comes in because. By virtue of the resurrection, if you believe in that, you believe that, in fact, that kind of risk is warranted. And, in fact, Jesus models it and demands it. Jesus says, you don't believe in life after death? I'll go first. You don't believe in resurrection? I'll go first. And you might say, well, yeah, but that was Jesus. And it's like, yeah, but did anybody rise from the dead before him? He had to have faith, too, to go to the cross and be beaten and be crucified and wear the mocking spittle of his enemies. You say, well, I don't believe in the resurrection. Well, okay, what options does that leave for you? Your well-being at the expense of your enemies. Your political tribe's well-being at the, at the bloodshed of your political adversaries. That's where that goes. And what the resurrection affords is to do what Jesus does, where in the garden when he's being arrested and Peter pulls a sword and cuts off the ear of the high priest, and Jesus says, oh no, and he heals the ear. And in a sense what Jesus says is, if there's going to be any bloodshed, shed my blood first. Well, who says that? That doesn't make the resurrection a cheap trick. It makes the resurrection a promise. So, so, so you've got these these arcs of civilization. So, is it Western Christendom that that the Protestant Reformation is now corrupting? Is it is it the American Empire that's going to fall? And and will will we, in a sense, you know, will the will the ecology collapse or will? It's, it's ironic because those on the left right now are fearing ecological collapse and those on the right are fearing moral collapse. And I would say, yeah, probably both. <laughs> probably everything. It's, you know, I'm this weird combination of sort of a, a, a cortical, as Jonathan Haidt calls the cortical, the cortical lottery, a cortical lottery winner. So I'm by nature rather happy and optimistic, but I've, you know, I've, I've been born into one of the most dour, religious traditions possible, Calvinism, you're all depraved. <laughs> but yet, Chris, Calvinist dour, you know, cow, dour pessimism is in the midst of this glorious Christian optimism. Christianity is the original divine comedy. The Bible is the original divine comedy. And I talked about that in my sister's eulogy that you can find on this page. And it talks about that in my father's eulogy that you can find on my YouTube site. That's way before I started doing this stuff. Or my aunt's eulogy that I posted. 
uh, I don't have a lot of confidence in technology because our track record with technology is it gives and takes away. And, and technology, especially in this frame that, that the distributist and Mencius Moldbug show, is that technology is an enabler of, in the sense, our internal destruction. Isn't that interesting? And, and it makes perfect sense. Of course we're going to make things to make sinning possible. Of course we're going to make things to, that, make, that make our ease possible and that ease will, will make us soft and we're going to be all in those chairs on Wall-E floating around. Of course technology brings us this way. It also gives us many things. And, and you know, I, I want medical technology. So here we are. The different time arcs I just talked about that. You know, let me not see the collapse of my culture. Let my let my kids not see the collapse of their country. Let 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 Ant let the let let the ice shelf in Antarctica not fall so that I have to see Florida go under. But all civilizations fall. And again, I'm a Christian, so God's kingdom will come. And, and, and it's sort of an apocalyptic parental control steps in, and the eschaton begins. But now we have to ask the question, which story governs? And we're back to the worldview choices menu here. Are you postmodern? There is no story. And, and this is why I think progressive liberation might, liberationism might just be natural religion, and that's, you know, that, that's, that's entropy. That's that's the slide left. That's that's where this all goes. We keep we keep looking for the liberation to be freed from all of be freed from the 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 necessity of self control. And uh, Drew Dyke, who um, is an author, and he's up in Portland, and I follow him on Twitter, and he was on the Phil Vischer uh, Sky Jatani podcast a number of times, and. I only kind of know him through Twitter, but just recently, recently wrote a book on self-control, and I haven't read it yet. I haven't even bought it. Maybe I will. I don't know. Those, I'm about to say something to get me in trouble, but you know, that type of Christian book, I, you know, I can usually just kind of page through quickly. <laughs> yeah, good point. Just good points. Maybe it's a great book. I don't know. I, I think Drew's a great guy. I love what he does on Twitter. But, you know, maybe that is in fact the slide that that technology and entropy and and we're just releasing ourselves some self control until everything falls away because we can't manage life in this world without self control and the most, in a sense, the most wonderful of all political situations, democracy can't exist without self control and and then we're just going to have these cycles of tyranny that we fall into fall into and, and maybe we'll be happy and say yeah i was i was fortunate enough to have lived in the united states at the end of the 20th and beginning of the 21st century and i only bego began to saw the, to see the decline but you know it's it's helpful to to read history too cuz what you find is that many times in many places we you know we're we're on the edge and and 1930s America was was on the edge, and 1950s America was on other edges, and 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 we're always on the edge one way or another, and that's why I talk about the age of decay. Life is not stable. Life in this world is not stable, and it never has been, and I don't think it ever will be, because again, one of how this video, the distributist video, really helped me see was this relationship between between this drift left and technology and how these two things are combined and how that scales out. And I don't have all my language on that, but it's in my head and my consciousness committee is working on it. So I'm sure it'll leak out in more videos to come, but that's a real thing. And and the point that he made in that video, yep, you know, you, yep, you colonized me, baby. You colonized me. But now we're back to which story governs. Is it postmodernity? If, if there, if, Postmodernity is basically just chaos, chaos and power in worldview. And, and that doesn't go anywhere good. And, and, and because it scales back down into us and, and it makes me want to say, why don't I just give in to all of my, all of my internal desires? Why don't I, why don't I give in and, you know, why? Why be faithful to a wife? Why be faithful to a lord? Why be faithful to a religious tradition? Why be kind to people on the street? Why be, you know, why, why not 
Just indulge myself. Eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow you die. And you've got axial eschatology, so, you know, I'm working through Verveke and his stuff, and you know, and he's he's right in that all of these systems they're axial, and and there, there's a there's a dynamic when by which if you can identify the development of something in history, in a sense, you demythologize it and you de-enchant it, and you know, kind of learning about the axial revolution, I can feel that having that impact on me, and I have to I have to think through those issues. I have to think about. The endless or the endless cycles of palingenesis, which is with something like Hinduism. You know, you ask um, ask some Hindus, well, why why if everything is this one great sea of of oneness and perfection, it devolves into the chaos, and then it goes back into the sea, and it goes back into chaos, and so you have this perpetual chaos and order swinging back and forth. I mean, a number of Eastern worldviews play on these issues, and and so you have Russian Doll, which again I mentioned and, and recommended on Netflix. Uh, you, do you seek resolution and escape, but then escape into what? And again, I'll prefer my my actual age, axial age eschatology. And and if you if you push me, I'll say, can can you imagine what what life of the age to come is like? And I say, no, I can't. That's because I see all kinds of issues. Will 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 the order get suffocating? Will there not be enough chaos? What does it mean that there isn't any sea? And and so then I look to smarter, wiser people like C.S. Lewis and his book, The Last Battle, and I. I, I work through, I think about those things. But finally, again, I, I think at, at, at what's what's at the heart of Calvinism is 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 finally trust. And I say, you know what, Lord, I, I my my brain isn't big enough. My my the amount of books that I can read and the amount of things that I can see in my one little short life, it ain't big enough. And I'll never know it all, and I'll never see it at all, and I'll always be biased, and I'll always be petty, and I'll always be wrestling with my own desires and urges, and 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 I'll always get stuff wrong, and I'll never be loving enough, and I will never make it. So I'm going to trust you and, and I'm going to believe that you are as good as you say you are. And I'm going to believe that that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And I'm going to believe that he walked out of that tomb. And I'm going to believe that that this affords me the this affords me the uh, the joyful yet suffering path of faithfulness and love in my relationships around me, even if the world is going to hell in a handbag. You know, someone someone made a comment in my conversation with 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 Alistair, you know how Alistair and I both you know when Jordan Peterson gets too mired in politics, we start to we start to grumble. And someone said, "Yeah, but that's because you're living in that's because you're living in a, you know, the, you think of a few best men. You can't handle the truth. There's people that stand on a wall that buy your that buy your comfort and buy your freedoms at the cost of their blood. And that's right." And that's a good point. That's an important point. And and how do you know that if you weren't in the prison camp that you wouldn't be just like, look at Tim Keller telling the story of Eric Little uh, at the end of Tim Keller's talk at Princeton at Princeton Seminary, where, and I've mentioned this in other videos before, where where Eric Little, you know, all the other priests and religious leaders and missionaries in that camp were just as cutthroat as everyone else. And Eric Little shone like the sun. And you'll find those stories coming out of concentration camps where everyone, uh, everyone, again, that's the walking dead. It's the zombie apocalypse. Everyone gets, gets petty and selfish and self-interested. My well-being at the expense of everyone else. And someone there will be a saint. And they will give their life for the others. And, and they won't do it, you know, just, just, we're so... We're so moment fixated. There's one grand gesture in which it's given. No, they'll do it slowly, bit by bit, like Jesus. Jesus dodges death again and again. And they tried to kill him, and they tried to stone him, and not Jesus. Not not my time. Jesus to be a saint does not mean being a doormat or a wallflower. To be a saint means you do exercise judgment, you do exercise agency, you do say no to people. But 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 sainthood, you learn to do it in a way that it, it's always for love. And it's always finally for, for the welfare, not just simply the little A B welfare that, that so often 
you know, th that's what happens. Uh, uh, someone, <laughs> the little, little Siddhartha shears from the sermon I preached last week, you know, you know, well, my daughter doesn't know sin. Oh, your daughter knows plenty of sin, honey. Just show her the word. She's probably going to become like your parents. You know, when the beggar on the street asks you for a dollar, do you give him the dollar? There's A, B. You know, I give him the dollar. Why do I give him the dollar? To get him off my back. You know, I dealt with this all the time in the Dominican Republic. You come out from come out from some place and some kid pops up. I watched your car. All right, you watched my car. Do I give you a few pesos just because it's expedient? Do I give you a few pesos because you're a poor kid? You're just trying to survive and there's no way you can. Or do I give you a few few pesos just to get you off my back? So you do the A, B morality and they say, yeah, but if you, if you encourage that kind of behavior, it scales. Boom, 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 boom. And so well, I need someone to follow in this stuff. And so I follow Jesus. Well, what would Jesus do? Well, it's a really hard question. It's not little A, B morality. It scales all the way out. And if I were the one in, in uh, Eric Little's prison camp, would I be just like one of those other missionaries? Then maybe I would. You know, it's it's hard to say. <coughs> but but the point the point is that it's misery, deliverance, gratitude, and I'm finally saved by grace, not saved by my performance. And I, I would hope I would have the kind of gratitude to, to not fail my master. Even though I know often I have the kind, I don't have the kind of gratitude because I do fail my master. <coughs> so which story governs? The option you embrace impacts the way you navigate your little cycle. I, I don't think A-B testing on goodness or wellness, Sam, is going to get you very far. POMO, which is basically chaos and worldview, eat, drink, and be merry. No. Palingenesia, karma? No, it's too law. It's too law. Renovation of heaven and earth. Costly love is the right side of history. That's what the resurrection says. It requires inner strength, which actually preserves society. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. It affords you release from self-salvationism tribal pressure for righteous compliance and virtue. Because here's the thing with, and Tim Keller makes these points better than just about anybody I know. Here's the thing about self-righteousness. If, Or here's the thing about the law. If I, if I achieve in complying with the law, I have now exercised the inner strength to possess that, and I can look down at all of those people that don't have it. And one of the things that we know is that this this business about having inner strength is not just. I mean, there's there's two there's two competing frames of human beings. One is that we have no agency; that we're just playing out the the bad things that happen to us as a child, or the good things that happen to us as a child. So the so the strong do well and the weak do poorly, and 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 therefore there is no agency, and you can't hold anyone accountable. Or the other vision is that we're it's all agency, and it's and you know. You know, by 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 free will and sheer determination. I had a my my wife had an aunt who, in the 1980s when crack was going on, used to brag because she'd say, you know, they say that once you take that first hit of crack, you're addicted. I'm pretty strong-willed. I think I could take crack. And and the idea of watching Aunt Ruth take crack that just really that tempted me mightily. I thought it wouldn't be too hard to places I live, it's not too hard to get some crack. Give it to Aunt Ruth. She never would smoke it because, of course, but she just wanted to make that point that she would, if she smoked crack, she wouldn't become addicted. And I thought, ah, you sure are a big believer in your will. And the irony was that she's passed now. Um, but but she had, she had a hard life. And, uh, that's the thing. And so those two worldviews of, 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 of we have no agency or we're all agency, oh, we're, we're a mixture and, and we're a mess, but you can't give up agency, but you can't give up understanding. And so that's the problem with the law is that even if it's inside, well, I alone, no, but then you're a Pharisee. Then you're a, that's not really fair to the Pharisees. Then you're a legalist and you look down on others. 
and and so I I think Tim Keller is exactly right that the real the real way to understand it is you're saved by grace, which means that I can't look down on those who are weak because I'm weak. But but I can't live with without I, I need the third use of the law. Again, that's why I'm a Calvinist. I need the third use of the law. I, I need to, I, it's, it's at the end of Saving Private Ryan, I've used this before, where, where, where Private Ryan is there and, and Tom Hanks and his squad have given up their life to, to fulfill this order, which maybe is kind of a crazy and stupid order. And, and Tom Hanks' dying last words to this young man are, earn it. And he wants to live his life living up to the great sacrifice. And, and I think that's one view into the Christian life. We live our lives trying to live up to that great sacrifice, and we know we never will. But, but, it's, but it's so beautiful, and it's so right, and it's so noble, and it, and it all comes together that I say, how do I want to live? I want to live like him. And he says, live like me, and die like me, and you will live again, and we'll go further up and further in. And why be a Christian? Because I don't think there's any more beautiful way to live. That's why I do it. Someone asked me in an email, and if you're still listening to my videos, he's still sending me emails, um, you know, why do you believe in God? I believe in God because I've always believed in God. I was raised believing in God. We, we only jettison beliefs when we have sufficient beliefs to, to get rid of the old ones. That doesn't answer why I'm a Christian. For most of human history, most people have believed in God, and the world was a mess. Just having people believe in God doesn't prove much of anything, So the book of James says. Seeing the beauty of Christ that will change your heart, that you decide, I'll willingly suffer. I'll willingly, I'll willingly sacrifice parts of me for the other. Doesn't you don't do it because the other is beautiful. You realize that doing it makes the other beautiful. And you realize doing it, you, you run towards the goal. That's what the Apostle Paul says. So, why does the left always win? I don't know. Why does the age of decay always win? But, ah, resurrection. So, the, the, the disruptivist strikes again. Keep striking, my friend. It's, uh... It's 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 great being wrong in all the right ways.